The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day, this first Sunday of the liturgical season of Lent as we journey together. I invite you to join us not only on the first Sunday, but in all of the Sundays as we head towards Holy Week. I want to make us all aware of a very special Wednesday night Lenten supper series that will begin uh, this coming Wednesday. And that is our Lenten usual soup suppers here in the Fellowship Hall uh, being replaced by services that will be shared by our youth each and every Wednesday. So you can find the location of those on our website. Uh, they'll be also on our YouTube channel. So do join us. A special live event is happening this Sunday afternoon between 2 and 3. Uh, our own Mark Gooch, elder of this church, is putting together a Zoom fellowship hour. And the address, Zoom address for that, can be found in the email that the congregation received, but also at the bottom of today's bulletin. If you'll pull that up uh, after the service elements, uh, Mark has his, his link there. Another thing you will find on the website, the opening page off to the right at the top, under worship services and resources, if you click on that and click on forms, the drop down, you will have an opportunity to sign up to be a liturgist for our Sunday service, to offer the prayers of the people, to bring us beautiful flowers and dedication of those flowers, uh, and also to join our sound and video team, which will be working diligently once we are all back here in the church together worshiping. So uh, I, I invite you, I encourage you to sign up for one of those um, worship opportunities. The flowers, beautiful flowers that we have today beside the pulpit are given by Susie and Steve Slack in honor of their families. And now, let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. For this first Sunday of Lent, we have two British composers of the 20th century. First of all, Gerald Finzi, who was born in 1900 and lived to the age of 55. He was a composer of many choral works and some larger orchestral works, including a cello concerto and a clarinet concerto. He wrote a beautiful set of five bagatelles for clarinet and piano, and I've offered several of those here at First Pres. The prelude today is a transcription by Robert Gower of one of those called Forvana, which to me sets the tone beautifully for Lent. The postlude is by Eric Tiemann, who was born in 1901 and lived until 1975. He was a self-taught organist and composer and was considered an outstanding member of the nonconformist school of music, in this case meaning that he played for a congregational church as opposed to Anglican or Catholic churches in London. He has 1,300 published works um, and not all of them are for the church, but that is certainly what he's best known for. Our musical offering today comes from Professor of Music at the College of Worcester, Carrie Delap Culver, who is in her 13th year of teaching as an associate professor here at the college. Uh, she got both her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Missouri. Her very able accompanist is Tony Shreve, pianist and vocalist and teacher in her own right. We thank these two musicians for sharing their inestimable gifts with us this morning.
I invite you to join me in our call to worship. We come so God might open our eyes, that we may discover the wonders all around us and embrace the joy deep within us. We gather so Christ might widen our hearts, that we may respond to the brokenness around us with the melodies of hope. We are here so the Spirit might teach us the ways of humility, that we, we may walk the way of enduring hope and faithfulness. Let us pray. Guiding one in all our journeys, help us to be open to your presence among us and within us. Teach us your paths and lead us into your truth, that we may embody your merciful, welcoming, and sustaining ways in our relationships with one another in all creation. Amen. Please pray with me our prayer of confession and then pray silently. O oh God, our help and our healing, you call us to a time of self-examination and preparation, but we resist, full of our own agendas. You alone know how impatient we are with others, with ourselves, with you. You know the burdens concerns, and worries we carry with us. Come close to us on the journey, we pray, with your forgiveness and steadfast love. Slow our pace and renew our hope in the promise that you are with us always, calling us into a deeper and richer life as we follow the way of Jesus. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. In every wilderness, on every road, in every moment, in every life, God is with us, bearing the gifts of forgiveness, courage, and unending love. So let us, with renewed hope, celebrate the richness and diversity of life in God's presence. Amen. Please turn to those around you and offer a gesture of peace. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Hi, this is our first Sunday in Lent, and during Lent, we are going to share some Bible stories with you. And we're going to share those stories by having some of our families help us. So today I brought Hudson with us, and we are going to share a story about a treasure. The scripture today is Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Once upon a time, there was a family who lived on a boat. The family owned two treasure chests. One was a wooden chest with a heavy metal lock. In it, they stored all of their money, jewelry, and fancy clothes. This chest was precious to the family. <clears throat> the other treasure chest was invisible. It could only hold vis invisible treasures. In the invisible chest, the family stored their love for each other, determination, hope for the future, and generosity. This chest was precious to the family. The, family. the family protected both treasures. Sometimes the invisible treasures, like generosity, would inspire them to give away some of their visible treasure. The invisible treasure would keep growing, the vi invisible treasure would keep growing no matter how much they gave away, no matter how empty the wooden treasure chest became. One day, there was a leak in the boat. Water began, began rushing in. The family escaped and swam to shore while their boat sank. Everything we owned is gone. Our treasure chest, all of our money, 
We will never see it again. One family mother, member looked over on the beach and saw nothing but her family. Her heart felt warm, even though her skin felt cold. Hey, everybody. Our invisible chest is here. It survived the sinking. They looked around, even though they were very sad to have lost their boat and their wooden chest of treasure. They still had their hope, love, determination, and generosity. That day, they picked up their even larger invisible treasure chest, and they started again. During the season of Lent, we slow down and figure out what is most important to us. Jesus called these things treasures. Sometimes our treasures can be seen and touched. Sometimes they're invisible. Jesus tells us we find out where our heart is when we name our treasures. Another way of saying this is, your treasures reveal what is important to you. This Lent, we will look about our invisible and visible treasures, and we will ask ourselves, what is most important to me and my heart? Let's pray. Generous God, you never run out of love. You never get tired of giving. Help us choose your ways of love and justice, giving instead of hoarding up for ourselves, and fill our hearts to overflowing. Amen. I invite you to join me in prayer at this time in our worship. And the prayer that I am offering is written by my wonderful pastoral colleague, our Paris associate, uh, Reverend Charles Curitan, and I am grateful for his offering this day. Let us, for these next few minutes, spend some time speaking with God and preparing in our silence to hear what God would speak to us. Let us pray. O God, who gives us life and breath, whose signature is imprinted on our souls, hear us now with closed eyes and focused minds as we shutter out everything that would come between us, wherever we are, and the one who loves and leads us. Thank you for all of those who have made us, led us, brought us to this time and place. For those who gave us birth, those whose skilled hands directed our arrival, and those whose loving arms rocked and cradled us in the natural rhythms of ages on ages past. For those who taught us and played with us and confirmed us in our own selfhood, for those who pointed us toward the future aims and encouraged us toward distant goals and counseled us when the winds turned and our course became unsteady. For those who chose us and gave themselves to us in love and filled our lives with the breath of richest beauty. For those little ones whom we helped to create as they joined us in strong and loving families. For those who have joined us in circles of friendship, working together in bonds of belief, growing together when uncertainties have taught us new directions. For these, and for an endless list of others who have supported us, and corrected us, and challenged us, and taught us, and shared with us as life has unfolded before and around us. As we enter together this week into a time of preparation, of self-examination, of getting ready for the blossoming of new life, give us grace to search our hearts, to find what we have allowed to be hidden, to hold up each part to the light of your loving, forgiving grace, to declare nothing out of bounds from you, and with the freedom of a little child who carries no secrets, to open ourselves to your open arms of forgiving welcome. As members of this congregation or of another congregation in our larger family, we would be your people 
in fact as well as in name, counting it a high privilege to help build a good, fair, supportive, inclusive, loving society. May we reach for opportunities this week to take a new step toward that goal. We carry with us in prayer today each member of our fellowship who has a personal need, especially our friends and comrades who have had surgery, who face days of hurt, who are, who are uncertain about their future, whose loneliness is chewing at their self-esteem, who long for warming sunshine, who feel their loneliness so deeply, who urgently need to reach out helping hands to distant or silent friends. Minister to their deep needs, we pray, and guide your earthly deputies as we seek to do so in your name. So may our helping shadows fall on those who need what we can give in your name and from your treasure house of good gifts. For we make all our prayers in the name and for the sake of the one who is our Lord, our friend, our guide, and our Redeemer, even Jesus Christ, in whose name we say once more the ancient prayer which binds us to all your disciples, past and present and into the future. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the still air, the music lies unheard. In the rough life of beauty, heights and sea, to make the music and the beauty. the 
Our scripture this morning comes from the first chapter of Mark, verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. And then the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This morning's scripture passage from Mark is a very quick-paced and bare-bones account of the beginnings of Jesus' ministry. No details of his birth or a few quaint childhood stories like what we see in the other Gospels. Instead, Mark's telling of Jesus' early days begins with his baptism by John the Evangelist in the Jordan River and the time spent by Jesus out in the wilderness. These are the stories that always show up around this Lenten time of year because they remind us of the uncertain and reflective, urgent yet purposeful ways we ought to carry ourselves as we inch closer toward the grit of Holy Week and the promises of Easter Sunday. This is actually why I really like seasons like Lent and Advent and find them more compelling than Christmas or Easter, for example. For me, it is in the journey and the preparations for those celebratory moments that I think we can learn the most about who we are and who God is calling us to be. We are often invited to begin our Lenten season with the perspective of wilderness wanderings so that we might find spiritual fortitude while we're out here for what is to come. And while that is certainly a fitting approach to Lent and one that has served us well in the past, I'm sure many of us would agree that for the last year, we have been in that place of wilderness and wandering into a series of unknowns. It was in the middle of Lent last year that our worlds were turned upside down with a pandemic. And indeed, so much has changed and continues to change since then. Sometimes I wonder if we have actually shaken off the dust and ashes of Ash Wednesday 2020. I know my back is slouched a little bit more from keeping this posture of grief and from being hunched over at a computer all day every day as I work from home. So perhaps the last thing that we want to think about this year is the complexity of a Lenten journey that only stretches deeper into unknown territory, with the paths forward covered in snow and ice and fallen branches and dense fog. Can our hearts and spirits really take another 40 days of this grief and fumbling? That might not be an answerable question, at least not by the time I get to the end of this sermon. But I do think our scripture this morning has something to teach us about how we might sojourn together through the next leg of this journey. In just seven verses in Mark's first chapter, we learn three significant events of Jesus' life as he began his ministry. The first is his baptism, where God names and claims him as God's own beloved child. 
The second is his experience in the wilderness where God sends angels to attend to him as he faces the accuser named Satan and the beasts of the wild terrain. Lastly, after John the Baptist's arrest, Jesus begins proclaiming God's proximity and reign while calling for repentance. In all three places, the common theme is God's closeness and presence. Just as God imparted God's spirit into all of creation in Genesis, God is here in the creative activity of Jesus' beginnings where we find him in Mark 1. What little we know from Mark's text is that Jesus travels all the way up from Nazareth to Galilee, over 100 kilometers north of Jerusalem, to join this guy named John's movement. Instead of parading into town with royal fanfare, which is what maybe would have been expected for a long-awaited Messiah, Jesus comes to the water's edge among the lines and the crowds of people gathered there, joining in solidarity with those around him. All those who were eager for something new, something transformative, and something real. And in that moment, Jesus doesn't demand any notable recognition or special treatment, but as soon as the waters wash over him, the text tells us that the clouds of heaven were torn apart and God's spirit came down like a dove to acknowledge the divine and special moment unfolding there at the river. God's arrival into the scene is the sort of kicking in the door way of telling us, hey, pay attention to this one. In this text, we witness a paradigm shift, a pivot into a new and other direction. That this Jesus character isn't some ordinary man, but is God's own beloved, who is covered in God's affirmation and delight. Where do we feel God's closeness or presence in our lives? Where do we experience the affirmation in who we are and who God is calling us to be? Who delights in you? And what is it that makes you come alive, feel connection and grounding? Shortly after this special moment of Jesus' baptism, he is very quickly pushed, or maybe shoved, out into the wilderness, where he is tempted and tested. Mark's telling of this experience doesn't give us much detail at all, and especially not about how Jesus felt or reacted while he spent that time in the desert wilderness. But I can imagine that he would have relied on the encouragement and the presence of God and the Holy Spirit to keep reminding him of who he is, why he's out there, and that he will make it through this difficult season. Whether it was a literal 40 days or an idiom for expressing an extended period of time, it couldn't have been easy for Jesus. Physically alone and isolated, without direct material support, and little, if any, reliable information about what's going on in the wider world or from back home. It certainly sounds like a familiar experience, and not just because we're stretching our Lenten muscles. We are living a wilderness existence, some of us feeling the weight of that reality more than others. In Jesus' case, here the presence of God was very near in the form of angels in waiting. I don't always know how to feel about the angels when they show up in scripture, but I can tell you that, at least symbolically, there are angels and divine goodness that accompanies us all the time, 
even when we aren't fully aware of it. This past week, I was given a few incredible gifts and opportunities to feel just how much this Lent is very different from the ones of previous years. On Ash Wednesday, I led a midday live service over Zoom for the College of Worcester community, and we reflected together on the creation myths as part of our theological origin story how we were formed by God's hands and made from the dust of the earth, the same place to which we will return one day when we complete the life cycle. This year, Ash Wednesday also happened to fall on my 31st birthday, which was a delightful and complex invitation to remember my own origins and my finite self as I begin another year of trying very hard to be a self-sufficient adult, a young professional, a better friend, neighbor, and mentor. I also gathered with students in the Ukirk campus ministry, and we reflected together on this same text from Mark, but putting it in conversation with Genesis 9, after the waters of the flood recede and God makes a new covenant with Noah and his family to never flood the earth again. In all of their wisdom, the students' wisdom, they shared the stories of how our faith tradition anchor us in times of chaos, but also challenge us to be more compassionate and more human in those times of uncertainty or wilderness, and when we begin new tasks and new journeys or embark on a new calling. The connection and the symbolism of flood water and baptismal water are complicated, they said, and that many things have the ability to be both cleansing and destructive or rupturing if we're not careful. These are the moments of being a chaplain in which I find the most delight and affirmation. Where I sensed God's presence calling out with encouragement as I accompany these students and the wider community into places of deep questions, complicated stories, and ritual aimed at making meaning. It is humbling every single time, but I could not have gotten here on my own. Lately, I'm more reminded than I ever have been of all of the past times, places, people, and experiences where I wandered and felt alone, but again and again, God revealed God's self through others offering a message of hope and belonging, telling me not to give up and to keep going. My spiritual origin story and the beginnings of my call to ministry were forged in metaphorical fire and in baptismal water sprinkled over me on my 11th birthday. These moments were sacramental they were emotional, and they're things that I've also wanted to distance myself from for, for a long time. And yet, here I am, working my, my way toward ordination, training to be a better chaplain and spiritual director, and hopefully doing my best uh, to invite us to expand our theological imaginations when it feels most difficult or scary to do so. So maybe this is the invitation from Mark's text and this early account of Jesus' ministry, that sometimes we have to go back to the beginning, where it all started. Instead of staring with glazed eyes and anxious hearts into the unknown of a wilderness future, 
what can we learn from reflecting backward on our lives, where we come from, our journeys and questions of faith, on the mythic yet so contemporary stories of scripture that challenge us to be more human. In the same way that God's Spirit covered Jesus in the Jordan River, God's Spirit is the creative force that is present in every part of this creative and created world. The Ruach that filled the expanse, that hovered over the waters and animated life, that formed us out of glittery dust. And when God did all of that, there was delight and affirmation in what God saw. God called each and every part of it good. The same way that God calls Jesus a beloved child, God marvels at us and the ways in which we are connected to God and to a divine spark through creative action. We were blessed by God's hands when we were formed, when we were baptized into a body and community such as this one, and when we struggle and feel the tension of venturing out into ministry, into the world, following a call to do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. But we cannot hope to do any of that if we forget the story and if we forget our stories. Without our past, no matter where they've taken us, where we've been, what happened there, we can't hope to be anchored in this life of faith. As we buoy along in the currents of this moment, it is how we affirm and delight in our stories, which cannot be detached from God's story, that gives us what we need to carry on. May we enter this Lenten season remembering where we come from. Remember and reconnect with your origin stories the things that have formed you, shaped you, and help keep you rooted. They will be your guides, even in the seasons of the wildest wilderness. May we walk with assurance that the same God who hovered over the world as it was created, the God who made us from dust and still calls us good, that God continues to be present in this time and place. Ashe and Amen. Friends, may we walk this journey of faith in this season of Lent, being reminded of who we are, who God has called us to be, and where we came from. Full circle, everything together. May you go in peace to know the love and the presence of God with you every step of the way, through wilderness and uncertainty, and through the fond, delightful memories of your story. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>